I am a physical therapist and exercise is really at the hallmark of what we, what we do as physical therapists in addition to many other things as well. Um, but you know, exercise is very important and important for maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Um, and you know, not only what we do as therapists, but something that I really enjoy doing myself um, and just believe in that it is um, for healthy living is, is kind of really where we need to be as far as what, what we should do for exercise and, and keeping ourselves healthy. All right, um, so some questions here that I hope to answer uh, with this presentation for you all. Um, and some questions, you know, that a lot of times come, come up when I'm in the clinic and, and people ask, well, why, why should I exercise? You know, what are the benefits? Why, um, you know, uh, what is it going to help me do other than make me feel really tired, you know, really out of breath or make me sweat a little bit, okay? Um, what, is, what type of exercise should you do? You know, there are many different things out there to do. Um, what is the best for you or what is, where's the best place to start? Um, and how much do I need? You know, you can exercise, you can be active throughout your day, but how much exercise of that actual strict exercise is um, beneficial? How much do we need to see improvements in, in what we're doing in our daily activities? Um, and how hard should I be working when I exercise? That kind of goes around like, with how much, but how hard? You know, you could exercise, um, you know, walk all day long maybe, but if you're walking at a faster speed, you may not be able to walk quite as far, you know. So those types of things. So those some, are some things that we'll help to address today, um, and hopefully you'll find helpful as we go along here. All right, so the benefits of exercise. There are many, many recorded benefits of exercise. Um, and it's been researched and, and looked at since 1950s and so forth. However, we do know that only 25% of the population gets the recommended amount of exercise and daily activity that's required, despite knowing all of these benefits that you see here. Okay, so it helps to maintain weight. Um, you, burn, you burn calories, you burn, um, um, you burn calories as you exercise, and so um, that helps to, to equalize, you know, the intake that you get. Um, reduces your, your blood pressure. Um, reduces your risk for diabetes and heart, heart attack and stroke, um, reduces arthritis and pain, okay? What's the first thing you want to do when you have pain? You want to stop moving, right? However, with, with arthritis, it's very important that you keep moving. Um, actually, when you move more, you get less pain with arthritis for most types. Um, just because of the way the joints are, it, it actually, the movement lubricates the joints, and so movement actually can be very beneficial. And by movement, you also gain strength and strength also helps to support your muscles and your joints, or supports your joints, which um, is where the arthritis is. So it actually relieves some pressure off of your joints as well. Reduces your risk for osteoporosis and falls. Um, so the more strength you, you get and the more weight-bearing activities, so walking, um, jogging, things like that, weightlifting, you actually gain um, bone strength. So that prevents osteoporosis. Um, you reduce the risk or the, the symptoms of depression. So overall, it helps to elevate your mood. It's a very, very important feature, um, but it just um, makes you overall feel better. Um, it, it increases the amount of, um, what do I want to say, the amount of neurotransmitters you have in your brain and, and can overall in, increase just how you feel day to day. Um, and improve, it actually helps to improve your cognitive processing speeds too. So you think better when you exercise regularly, okay? All right, so the types of exercise here. All right, so we have aerobic or cardiovascular type of exercise, and we'll get into what each of these are. Um, and that would be more on the lines of like a running, uh, jogging, walking, biking, those kinds of things that you do for a longer period of time um, that really kind of get your heart rate up there. Strength training, so using weights or resistance or some sort to keep your muscles nice and strong. Um, flexibility, so doing some stretching, um, keeping your muscles limbered up, your joints um, mobile, um, as well as balance. Okay, so it's a combination of all four of these activities that make up an excellent exercise program. Um, and we'll get into how much you need to do of each of these or what's recommended. Okay, so aerobic exercise. Um, 
kind of what we think of as, as exercise. If you think I'm going to go out and exercise, you think I'm going to go out and go for a walk or I'm going to go out and go for a run. Um, so it, overall, I mean, aerobic exercise, what it's doing, um, improving your body's ability to work and participate in activity um, by using the oxygen and training your body to release energy. So it gives you energy and then it gives you, um, it, it trains your body to use that oxygen efficiently. Okay. Um, it also trains your heart. So um, the more you use it and the more you, um, you challenge it, the more efficient your heart actually gets. Okay. All right, so the benefits here. Again, the weight management. Um, you can actually reduce fatigue with aerobic exercise. Kind of seems counterintuitive, but the more you exercise, the more you get a better tolerance for it, okay? So a lot of times with, with the patients that I see, they say, well, I don't want to exercise because it makes me feel so tired, okay? It makes me feel like I can't do anything for the rest of the day. Well, actually, you know, that, that fatigue is true. You know, you do get tired after you exercise, and that means you're actually exercising correctly. <laughs> So um, keep that in mind, but it will, it may make you tired for, for, for a certain period of time, but overall it will reduce the fatigue that you feel on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? And that's that process of training your body. Um, it'll help you to maintain your mobility, okay? So the more you walk, the better you get at walking. You know, if you, if you don't use it, the saying is that you lose it. So, um, you, you know, the, depending on, not to mention it makes your, your muscles stronger, your heart stronger, so you can tolerate more activity as you go along. Um, improves your mood, improves the mental health and mood, again, um, that reducing depression. Um, helps to improve your sleep. So if you're having difficulty sleeping, think about what you're doing throughout the day. Are you sitting down and being um, less active throughout the day and then you realize you can't sleep at night? Well, maybe that's because you don't get enough activity during the day to keep your or to make your body tired enough to sleep, you know, and you don't get good sleep either. Um, reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease. Again, you're training the heart, um, you're training your your body, your your muscles how to take up um, take up oxygen and use that oxygen efficiently, um, so you can um, complete your day to day activities. Uh, so the recommended amount. Um, or the recommended frequency of aerobic activity would be about three to seven days per week, okay? So this is something you kind of have to adopt and, and find what works best for you um, and really enjoy what you're doing, okay? Because if you don't enjoy what you're doing, you're not going to do it. Um, and that's a lot of times what I have to go to um, with, with the individuals that I see because if I tell them to do, you know, I want you to go out and bike for an hour, well, if they don't know how to bike or if they don't like to bike, they're not going to do it, regardless of how good it is for you. Um, so really find that thing that you like to do and it's easier to stick to. All right, so how much do I really need? Okay, so th these recommendations come from the CDC. And this is really what we recommend for all of our patients in our population that we see. Um, so it says two hours and 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. So what that equals out to be, so 150 minutes, Okay, um, and it actually, if you break it down, it's 30 minutes a day. Okay, so that two hours and 30 minutes seems a little overwhelming, <laughs> um, but it's, it's per week, okay? Um, and then that's that moderate intensity, and we'll get into what the moderate and then the, the vigorous below that means as well, okay? Or if you wanna do a little bit higher intensity type of exercise, so this means you're working a little bit harder Okay, breathing a little bit heavier, you get tired quicker, um, it would be one hour and 15 minutes a week or um, 75 minutes total, okay, um, a vigorous intensity. So if that seems a lot, and it, and it does kind of, if you haven't been doing, if you haven't been as active as you like to be, you know, going out and I consider it, you know, consider the average person um, deciding to run a marathon and, and going out the next day and doing it. It's going to be very, very hard. It's a very daunting task. Um, so a good way to break it up, you know, you want to do those types of activities in no less than 10-minute periods, okay? So if you think about it, you've got 30 minutes, right, in a day. You take up morning, you do 10 minutes, afternoon, and evening. You know, there you got your 30 minutes, okay? Um, and so if, you, if you're able to break it up like that, it's, it's a bit more manageable, okay? And then you can really kind of see, well, can I do a little bit more next time? Can I do 12 minutes? Can I do 15 maybe? And then you only need to do it twice a day. 
And so you can really try to work up and, and shoot and, and set those goals that you need um, in order to meet those recommendations. And it's possible. It really is. And it, you just have to make it manageable and, and kind of wrap your mind around it as well. Okay, so intensity. All right, so that moderate intensity I was talking about, that 30 minutes of moderate intensity um, would be considered uh, brisk walking, um, water aerobics, ballroom dancing, gardening, um, I guess light gardening, so you wouldn't be shoveling or lifting dirt or things like that. But so brisk walking, um, so enough where a good way to tell the intensity that you're working at, um, so is, is what we use is called the talk test. Okay, can you be exercising and can you still maintain a conversation without feeling like you're out of breath? Okay, um, so you should be able to, to maintain a conversation. However, you shouldn't be able to feel like you can sing. Okay, singing takes a lot more breath and a lot more, um, yeah, it takes more breath, I guess, than, than just holding a conversation. And so if you can sing, then maybe you can increase your speed a little bit or increase your intensity. It's a good way to kind of measure how hard you're working. Okay, um, so that is that 30 minutes a day, two hours and 30 minutes a week. Vigorous intensity, on the other hand, would be more um, jogging or running, uh, swimming laps, biking at 10 miles per hour or greater, jumping rope, heavy gardening. So that's more of like the shoveling, the lifting dirt, um, getting down hands and knees, carrying objects and so forth, um, or hiking uphill. Okay, the, all of these things will actually are more, the intensity is higher, so it'll actually make your heart rate go higher. Okay, so you're working at a higher level. Um, so at this point, you won't be able to say more than a few words at a time before getting short of breath or feeling like you have to take another breath. You know? So we can normally make a full sentence without taking a breath, right? But if you're working hard, you might get out two or three words and then feel like you have to take another breath. So you can say, I'm feeling good today. <laughs> you know, as you're exercising. So if, if it's that case, if you can't fluidly say a sentence, that would mean that's a more vigorous intensity exercise. All right. You can also measure intensity by heart rate. Okay. There are a lot of different heart rate monitors out there. They've got the fancy polar, polar monitors or garments, whatever it is. Um, and you don't really need anything that fancy. Um, if you go to the gym, um, a lot of times the exercise equipment will have those heart rate monitors on them. They're the little metal pieces, um, either on the handles or sometimes on the bikes next to them. You have to put both hands on there, and it'll tell you what your heart rate is. Okay? Um, a good way to determine the heart rate, your maximum heart rate, okay? So it would be that um, an age predicted maximum. And the easiest way to do that is just to take 220 minus your age. Okay, there are many different formulas to use, but that's by far the easiest one. Um, so 220 minus your age will give you your maximum. So as we get older, our maximum heart rate actually decreases, and that's just physiologically the way our bodies are made. Um, so you get the maximum. You never, you, as you're exercising, you'll never get to that maximum, hopefully. <laughs> okay. um, but your target heart rate to be at that moderate intensity level would be to be 60 to 80% of that. Okay, so you take whatever 220 minus your age is times 0.6 to 0.8, and then you'll get that range that's most beneficial. Okay, and that range is, is what's proven to be helpful in improving your endurance, improving your stamina, um, improving those cardiovascular benefits as well. That's what really leads to those improvements in the, the cardiovascular system. Um, just a word of caution, if you are on any certain medications, um, some that come to mind are some beta, um, beta blockers, um, if you have a pacemaker and things like that, heart rate isn't as accurate, heart rate is not accurate as far as intensity goes. Okay, so just um, if you are on any specific medications, ask your doctor if they change what your heart rate does, because sometimes those medications will lower your heart rate and you just won't even see, see it go up at all. Um, all right, another way to measure intensity, and we use this a lot in the clinic, um, is what we call our rate of perceived exertion, okay? So this is different for everybody, because it's perceived. It's subjective and it's up to you, okay? Um, so you self-rate yourself based on how hard you feel you're working, okay? So we, as far as zero goes, you're resting, you know? Maybe even, you know, you're sleeping maybe. 
Um, 10 would be extremely hard. You don't feel like you could push any harder. You know, your legs give out or you know, whatever bad things would happen at extremely hard. <laughs> okay. Um, so you're pushing as hard as you possibly could. Um, so anywhere in there, we really use to, to rate, you know, and every day it may change. You know, one day you might be doing the same amount of activity and you feel like you're working really hard and the next day you're doing the same amount but it feels so much easier. You know, it can change from day to day based on how tired you're feeling, uh, how much sleep you've had the night before, um, what you've had to eat, how hydrated you are. All of those things are very important um, and can change the way you feel when you're actually doing and performing exercise. Um, so as far as the moderate goes, we like to keep, um, instruct people to keep between a four to a six out of 10 on this scale that you see here. So four to six would be sort of hard to hard. Okay, you feel like you're working hard. Um, but again, you can still maintain that conversation. You're not too short of breath where you lose, you know, what you're able to, to say. Um, the vigorous then would be seven to nine out of 10. All right, and that's very hard to sustain for a long period of time. Um, so if you're working really hard, you know, maybe you work hard for short periods of time and then you work a little bit easier, hard and then a little bit easier. But most likely the moderate is more, um, the moderate is more enjoyable, should I say, <laughs> okay? So, um, and it has the same amount of benefits as you would say the vigorous would, okay? All right, then we get into strength training. Um, so strength is very important, especially as we age. We lose about 10% of our strength starting from our second decade of life. So starting when you're 20, you lose 10% of your strength every decade of life, okay? So if you think about that, that's pretty significant, especially when you're getting to be 80, 90, and so forth. Um, so strength training is a great way to maintain your strength Incre increase your strength, um, and, it, and we know strength is strongly correlated with mobility and functional activities. Okay, so the stronger you are, the more independent you stay. Um, so it's actually, the, the definition would be the use of resistance to force a muscle to contract. Okay, so you're, you're contracting a muscle, but it's against a certain resistance, okay? Um, optimal benefits, uh, completing to the point when it's hard for you to do another repetition. Okay, so you could lift two pound dumbbell maybe all day long, right? But you can still, you can continue with that. Um, it's not as optimal, um, we'll get into the optimal amounts, but um, to, to keep doing repetitions that feel easy for you. Okay, you don't get as good of benefits if you're lifting a weight that's, that's easy for you and you feel like you could lift all day long, okay? All right, so the benefits of strength training, one would be to build strength, right? Um, maintain bone density. So there's that osteoporosis again. So you can increase your bone density by doing resistance, resistive type of exercises. Um, it improves balance, coordination, and mobility. Okay, you ask why? Well, if you're doing any strength training when you're standing, you're using your balance, okay? Your balance is also strongly related to your strength. So the stronger you are, the better balance you have, okay? So if you don't have strong muscles, it's gonna be hard for you to keep your balance and maintain your posture as well. Um, it reduces the risk for falling, again, because the stronger you are, the less risk of falls you have, um, and maintains independence in performing activities of daily living. All right, so recommended frequency, two to three times per week. Okay, so less than the aerobic exercise. Um, and, you know, every other day, you know, so you give your body a day to rest is very beneficial as well. Okay, so strength training, the intensity of the strength training that you should, or that is most beneficial. So ways to change your intensity, all right? So the resistance that you use. So there's many different types of resistance. So you can use, you know, at the, at the gym or at, uh, fitness center, they have uh, those resistance machines. They have the dumbbells, um, you know, the, st the, the stretchy bands, the elastic bands, um, and even using your own body weight are good ways to change the resistance that you're using. Um, but again, it's that resistance that you wanna do um, that feels, feels heavy for you at first. It's doable, but it feels heavy, okay? Um, if you're doing it and it feels light to begin with, it's probably gonna feel light throughout your whole exercise routine, 
Okay, so you want to find that spot where it's, it feels heavy, you know, and it should because you're actually working the muscle. The muscle has to be um, stressed and it has to be um, challenged in order for it to build strength. Um, the repetitions. Usually, um, you know, a good goal would be to be about 10 repetitions of each exercise that you do. Um, if you can get to 10 and you don't feel tired, you could probably use a little bit heavier weight. Um, you could also go, um, if you can do easily, if you can do 20, you can definitely get a, a stronger or a heavier weight or heavier resistance, okay? Um, so anything more than 20, and we'll get into how to progress those as well. Um, and sets, so if you, so repetitions would be, you know, I can do 10 in a row, and then if you take a break, you can come back and do another 10. So that would be two sets of 10, okay? And usually that is sufficient as long as you're feeling tired by number 10, okay? All right, so indications for progression of strength training. Again, you can also kind of use these principles to finding the weight initially as well. So um, where do you get to the gym and where do I start? There's this whole stack of weights. Where do I put that, you know, where do I put the um, resistance at to start with? Okay, so maybe the first couple times where you go and do your, your program to begin with, um, you're, you're kind of finding out what, what will work for you. You know, what's the best place to start? And it's trial and error at first, you know. Um, so you're able to complete two sets of 10 repetitions with good form. Okay, so again, you're getting to the end of those, those, that set and you still feel, hey, I could, go, I could go more, you know. That might be indication that you can step it up. Um, that you don't require a break after a set of 10. So again, if you don't require a break, then you're going all the way to 20 or something, something like that. Um, and you can do 20 repetitions with good form without a rest break, okay. So those are all good indications as to um, ways that you know that either the weight is too light for you to begin with or that you're ready to progress on to the next, next resistance level, okay? It's also important after you start every week or every two weeks or so that you increase the weight again, okay? So we're challenging our muscles to begin with. Um, then after a while, our, our bodies get used to that. Okay, they've built strength. Then they need to be challenged yet again. Okay, so then we come back to these indications for progression, and then we, we re, um, reassess and maybe increase each of those resistances again because our muscles need to continue to be challenged in order to continue building strength. Otherwise, if you keep doing the same thing, everything will stay the same. Okay, which isn't always a bad thing, right? But if you're working to build strength, and that's, that's the main goal, you really have to work to progress um, those exercises that you're actually doing. Okay, flexibility, another good one, okay. A good stretching routine is very, very helpful and very important. Um, so the flexibility is to have the ability um, for your of your joints to move through a full range of motion, okay. So um, if we don't move through full, full motions um, much, we lose those motions. Again, it's the use it or the lose it, okay? Um, so having flexibility allows for more movement around your joints, okay? Which can mean for you better posture, um, less muscle tension and soreness, especially important after you exercise. Um, reduces your risk of injury from repetitive use. You give your muscles a, a break, a time to relax, um, and more relaxation for your body and your mind, okay? Um, so a good way um, that's, you know, flexibility is oftentimes overlooked. <laughs> I'll, um, it, I mean, I admit to that too. It's the last thing I want to do after I exercise. You know, I want to be, I did all my hard exercise, now I just want to be done. Okay. But it's also a very important, important aspect of, of exercise as well in that it will help you actually reduce, um, reduce the, the soreness that you feel afterwards. Um, and, and allow you to maintain your program that you're actually doing. All right, flexibility, so the frequency of flexibility, so it says two to seven days per week. That's a wide range, <laughs> okay? Um, and so it's, um, you know, a good routine that you can do daily 
is probably the optimal way to do that. So finding a time of day that works best for you that you can really fit that into your schedule and, and just feel like you get a good start to your, maybe it's in the morning and you feel like you can get a good start to your day. Um, um, whatever works for your schedule. Um, so the intensity that you should stretch or you know, stretch the muscles, stretch your joints. Um, so a slight sensation of resistance and mild discomfort. Okay, so it shouldn't be sharp pain, it shouldn't be intense pain, but you should feel a stretch, okay? Um, and it should be along the muscles that you're trying to stretch. If you're feeling it some other place, well, then there might be another issue, okay? So, um, so it shouldn't be discomfort, okay? It should feel nice and you should feel like it's allowing you to relax. If you're stretching and you're feeling like, I'm just so tense I can't even relax, it's probably a little bit too intense, okay? So then you can just back off. Um, and not do quite as much motion, okay? So the types of flexibility or stretching exercises would be gravity assisted. So, you know, going down and, and touching your toes is a way that you're, you're using your, your trunk body weight to stretch out maybe your legs or something, okay? Um, your body position, so, um, you know, pulling the knee up to your chest um, and helping to pull it up, you know, if you're pulling your knee up, you're stretching kind of the back of your leg. Um, or, you know, stretching your arms or whatever it may be, um, <clears throat> just based on different positioning of your body, um, something out of what you're not used to, the normal posture that you're, you're doing. Also, um, using straps um, as ways to stretch um, shoulders, legs, anything like that. And yoga uses a lot of straps as well, so that's why they think about when I think straps. Um, the, the fourth type here, and I don't know that this made it into your handouts, but is balance, okay? Um, so balance is the ability to move and remain in a position without losing control or falling, all right? So you see where that's important with a lot of our, um, a lot of the population that we see is the falling, okay? Maintaining your posture, maintaining the control that you have in order to do your daily activities. So, um, so walking, moving, transfers, um, getting out of bed and, and so forth. Um, so the balance, the benefits of balance activities um, reduce the occurrence of, of falls or injuries, um, ability to access the community, um, and negotiate uneven surfaces. Uh, so any, anytime you're walking on a different surface, whether it be grass, gravel, um, uneven sidewalks, um, sand, things like that, you're using different balance systems, okay? So it's important to train all of your balance systems in order to negotiate all of those different types of environments and surfaces and feel comfortable doing so, okay? Um, it also, you, you also use your balance a lot when you walk up and down stairs, okay? Um, handrails are very helpful, but if you ever try to walk up or down stairs without a handrail, you might notice your balance is quite different, okay? And that's because you're having to stand on one foot for a period of time. Okay, you're having to balance your body weight over one foot as you lift your other foot up to step to the next stair. And if you don't have anything to hold on to, it can make you feel pretty unstable. Um, we also, you know, walking in itself is, is the ultimate balance um, because you actually spend, um, what is it, 60% of your walking cycle on one leg. Okay, so um, the typical walking cycle, you're spending most of the time standing on one foot. Okay, running, there are times where you don't spend any time on either foot. Okay, so that takes a lot of balance too. Um, but also stepping up onto a curb, that same thing as the step. You know, you're standing on one foot and you gotta raise the other one up. Okay, um, the frequency of balance activities should be done daily. Okay, so in, in doing balance exercises, um, you know, simple as, depending on how stable you feel, okay, it can be just as simple as standing in place and bringing your feet together. Okay, um, you can see this gentleman down here, he's standing on one foot and working to keep his balance on one foot. Okay, a good way to do that, um, if you have got something close by, you know, just touching onto the kitchen counter or something and then lifting up your foot. You've got something to hold on to, but you're getting used to getting your weight over that one leg. Um, so the, the variables that you can change to practice your balance are your sense of touch and your feet. Okay, so he's changing his sense of touch by standing on these various items here, okay? So he's standing on like a, uh, probably like an air-filled 
bladder kind of, kind of deal, so it's really unstable. Um, and then he's also standing on a foam cushion, which is also very unstable. Okay, so that's changing his, his sense of touch through his feet. You can also change that sense based on how you position your feet as well. Okay, so if I have my feet together, my balance is different than when my feet are apart, right? So if my feet are together or if my foot is heel to toe, my balance is much, my balance is much different, okay, if I'm standing here with heel to toe. And that's the way to change your sense of touch through your feet. Um, also, that one, one leg as well, okay? Um, the other one is your vision, okay? So if you notice it's more difficult to keep your balance or you notice more, like you're more unsteady when you're getting up to use the bathroom at night. You know, you, you depend so much on your vision to keep your balance that if you, um, if you lose that vision, you feel very, very unstable, okay? So a good way to challenge, um, it, you know, your vision, or not challenge your vision, but challenge the other systems is to take away your vision. So just by closing your eyes, okay? When you're doing any of these also, you know, when you close your eyes, it's, it's very important that you're standing near something. You feel safe when you're doing it, okay? Standing in something, something sturdy, um, something that you can hold on to if you need to. Um, also, the third sense that we use and is very important is our inner ear, okay? So that would be our vestibular system. Um, and so when these other two senses aren't available, like you are walking in the dark, your eyes, okay, so that takes away your vision, and you're on the beach, takes away your sense of touch, or it changes that, or walking in the dark in, on gravel, that changes how your balance functions. And if your, your inner ear isn't working as strong as it should be, your balance won't be as strong as it should be either, and it can place you at higher risk for falls, okay? So changing any of those variables can, can work to actually improve your balance, okay? All right, so we've gone over the four types of exercise, okay? Now, where do we start, right? So you're all here, that's a great start. You're interested in the topic, that's excellent. Um, so oftentimes it's the getting started and getting motivated that's the most challenging part, okay? So it's recommended, you know, set aside a time. You know, you really want, you really want to do this, find a goal that's interesting to you. You know, you want to be able to, um, join this or participate in a certain event or something and you want to be able to be in, in good health and, and good fitness to do that. So that's the goal you're working towards. Um, so set aside some time every day that you can, you can do each of these things and make a schedule and a routine. Find activities you enjoy. All right. So like I was saying before, if you don't enjoy what you're doing, you're not likely to do it. Okay, um, it's going to be, at first it might be easy to maintain, but after a while if you get into the routine and it's a chore to go and do it, you're likely not going to. Okay, so um, activities you enjoy. Maybe you enjoy being with your friends, so find a friend to do it with you or um, social situations in, in which that would be more enjoyable for you. Um, and identify barriers and address them as necessary. So barriers, those are big ones because we all have excuses, right? All right, barriers to exercise. All right, you're just saying, I'm just so busy, I have no time to exercise. All right, so some ways you can maybe address that. Um, set aside a time, schedule time every day, um, 30 minutes before you eat dinner or something, you know, those, really look at your schedule and think where can I fit this in because um, I think if you take a closer look there's minutes 10 minutes here or there and again those 10 minutes right you can add up to 30 minutes eventually um, convenience so do you have to drive to the fitness center uh, put on your swim put on your bathing suit and get into the pool or is it um, just as convenient as walking out your door you know, if water aerobics is what you enjoy the most, is that convenient, okay? If it's not as convenient or if it's across town or um, some other location that's not as likely to get to, it may not be as easy to maintain that. Um, motivation, um, feeling like you're just too tired or you don't know where to start or you're just, you would rather watch TV or sit on the couch and watch the ne next episode of whatever 
has just come on. Um, so motivation is a, is a tough one to get over, but a good way to do that, again, is to exercise with a friend. Um, set up a, um, you know, there are a lot of fitness classes, exercise classes that have a schedule. So if you don't get there at that time, well, you miss the class, okay? So that's, it's easily scheduled for you, it gives you motivation, it gives you social interaction as well. Um, reduce confidence, so feeling like you're not safe when you're doing the exercise. Um, you know, if you're unsteady when you're walking, maybe walking isn't the best option for you at this time. Maybe um, starting on like a stationary bike or something would be more helpful. Um, so finding those places where you feel most comfortable and confident that you'll be successful. Um, access to equipment and facilities again. Um, do you have a membership to a fitness center or do you have, you know, if you're feeling unsteady walking you need a bike, do you have a bike? You know, those types of things can all be barriers. Um, fear of injury or not quite knowing what to do. Um, there are a lot of other resources out there. A lot of the senior centers, um, community centers have um, instruction. Um, you know, if you sign up for a gym or a fitness center, oftentimes they'll go through and tell you how to use each equipment. So if you're afraid of injuring yourself on the equipment, there's somebody there to help you. And they're willing to help you and that's what they're there for, to teach you how to use those things. Um, it's boring. <laughs> Well, um, again, that's at finding those things that you like to do. Um, and lack of support from your family or friends. So if you don't have any support or if you're feeling like you're just kind of out on your own, that's very, can be very, very challenging. Um, so any of those, I mean, and, and there's more out there. We have plenty of excuses. There's more barriers out there than I can even list or think of. Um, but the important part is that you can, address, you can identify those barriers for yourself and, and kind of address how to overcome those as well. All right, so tips for success. Exercise in groups or with friends. I like to do this also. <laughs> it's very challenging for me to go out and, and just run on my own. I would much rather enjoy catching up with a friend and um, you know, enjoying a good conversation as we exercise together. Um, it, it also increases my mood drastically when I'm with a friend versus not, and psychologically it's very, very helpful too, motivation-wise. When you want to give up, your friend will encourage you to keep going, if they're a good friend. Okay. <laughs> if not, maybe find new friends. No, just kidding. Um, but it also makes you accountable. You know, you, you set aside this time for exercise, and you think, oh, I don't want to go, I'm so tired today. Your friend says, when are we going? Why aren't you here yet? You know, it holds you accountable. It, it makes you, it makes you get get to where you're going to, to start your exercise, okay? Whatever that may be, it's very helpful. Um, you, know, you know if I don't show up, she'll be very angry at me, you know, those types of things. So find exercises or activities you enjoy, like we had spoken about earlier. Um, if needed, break up your exercise into shorter amounts of time, okay? Um, 10 minutes, that's all you need to do, right? 10 minutes per time. And variety is always good, so change it up frequently. If you're getting bored, find something new. Find something more exciting. Um, whatever you're feeling in the mood for that day, okay? All right. So the questions that I hope we answered here, okay? Why should I exercise? Well, the numerous health benefits that are out there, okay? Um, and in order to maintain your, your physical functioning and your independence, um, as well as your overall health. Okay. Um, what exercises are most beneficial? Well, a combination of a lot of activities, but the most beneficial are going to be ones that you enjoy doing. Okay. Can't say that enough. Um, but also the aerobic strength, balance, and flexibility, a combination of all of those, but enjoyable for you. Um, and how much exercise do I need? Just as a reminder, that 150 minutes a week of moderate aerobic exercise, um, two to three days, two to three days a week. Um, how hard should I be working? Using that talk test again. Are you able to talk and maintain conversation as well as that perceived exertion as well if some days are more challenging than others? All right, so if you want any further resources about exercise or about starting a program, the CDC has a ton of information and resources for you as far as health benefits, getting started, um, all of those barriers they have information on and suggestions to overcome them. Um, consult with your physician regarding any health concerns that you may have prior to starting a program. If you're not sure it's going to be to your benefit, speak with them, okay? Um, it's something that I think they would all encourage um, and, and um, 
give you resources that you need in order to, if you do have those health, health risks as well. Um, as well as consulting any healthcare professionals, physical therapists, that might be biased, but um, a nutritionist, also very helpful in healthy living choices, um, and your physician as well. And there's other health professionals out there as well. Um, those are just a few that came to mind here. All right, are there any questions? Yes. What kind of, how about deep breathing exercises and yawning exercises mm -hmm. and bed and chair exercises? Yes, yep. Okay, um, and the question was, um, what about deep breathing and yawning exercises, um, bed and chair exercises? Yeah. I think those are all great exercises. Um, so especially the breathing is very important, okay? It keeps your, your um, rib muscles or your, the muscles in your core nice and strong, okay? I think that's very important. Um, also, you know, chair exercises, you know, if you don't feel safe when you're standing, to do exercise of any sort. It's also, you can also sit down and do any type of exercise there as well. Um, same with within the bed as well. Um, and just making sure that you're feeling like they're challenging for you, okay? Um, and and ways, think of ways that you can, if, they're, if you're feeling like they're easy for you, think of ways that you could maybe challenge yourself a little bit more. But yes, all of them are very important. Mm -hmm. I was told that you hold, you do a deep breathing exercise and you hold your breath can you say that again? If you <coughs> take a deep breath and mm -hmm. you hold it, it sends your optical uh, pressure up. Okay, so the question was that if you take a deep breath and hold it, it um, sends your op optical yeah. pressure up? Pressure right, so if you're holding your breath when you do exercises, especially um, Strengthening exercises, it actually increases your blood pressure um, and the pressure the, in the eyes as well, you're right. Um, so it's important to maintain your breath and your breathing when you're, when you're exercising. So if you're exercising and you're straining so hard that you're not breathing, you're here, right? You're actually increasing your blood pressure, which isn't, the, which isn't necessarily safe, okay? So you wanna make sure you can lift a load that you aren't straining and you breathe in as you lift up and maybe breathe out as you go down, right? Because you want to avoid any of those increases in pressure. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking at some articles on the relationship between uh, bicycle therapy and Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. um, do you do any bicycle therapy with Parkinson's patients here? Right, so the question was if we do any bicycle um, exercises with Parkinson's here, and we do. Yes, so I think the theory behind the bicycle exercises, um, whether it's um, forced use or if it's, are you talking about like road cycles or like road bikes or things like that? Or well, was it I, like the tandem biking? I read one article about um, Parkinson's patients being on stationary bikes, but I actually saw a YouTube video okay. with a, um, a person who could hardly stand up while he was walking and they put them on a bike in a parking lot and the guy just like. Right. Okay, so, so I think you're referring huh? to the, the bike, the, the biking on the road, kind of the normal, yeah, the normal upright bike. Yeah, right, exactly. yeah. Um, we don't use any normal upright bikes here, but um, we do use like our recumbent bike is, is the safest one that we, we can use. Um, and the bike that we have is actually not like a forced use. It doesn't, the, the a lot of, the, the recent biking um, research for Parkinson's is more forced use, so it's a bike that actually keeps a cadence for you. Um, and it was actually thought of by um, one of our colleagues in, in Cleveland, Jay Alberts, who um, had a friend on a tandem bike, and it actually kept the, the person on the front kept the pace for the person on the back. And when she got off, she noticed she could walk a little bit better. So that forced use of making you work harder than, than your body wants to work for Parkinson's, yes, it can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. In your practice, why is it that you use the uh, perceived, perceived exertion rate mm -hmm. as opposed to the heart monitor? Would it be more unreliable? Right. So we, um, the question was, why do we use the perceived exertion rate versus the heart rate? Um, it can be, um, they're, both, they're both helpful, okay? So if we have anybody who's on um, like beta blockers or heart lowering medication, it's not, we can't use that as far as 
telling how hard they're working. Um, sometimes with Parkinson's also, the heart rate isn't, doesn't respond as a person without Parkinson's. So that's something that you know, they can feel like they're working harder, but their, um, their heart rate will probably not go up to that 60 to 80 percent range. So that's a good way for us to kind of monitor, um, you know, perceive, do they feel like they're working hard or they feel like they're working easier? Can we push them harder? You know, because um, heart rate isn't always accurate. Um, and put that caveat in there, I guess. Um, but it's also, it can change your, your perceived exertion can change from day to day as well based on other factors.